Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our July monthly buzz. I feel like I say this every single month. I cannot believe it is July. I mean, I don't, I don't know where the time goes. It absolutely flies by. Uh, I can't believe we're already, for Texas anyway, in the dog days of summer. Honey harvest is, we're in the middle of honey harvest, or it's over for a lot of people. It's just incredible how fast time flies and how hot it's been. It is unbelievably hot this year. And that's not just a Texas thing. I mean, it's it's hot everywhere, you know, nationwide. You know, we're seeing this worldwide. We're seeing this huge heat wave. I was visiting with someone from the uh, uh, Hill Country area, um, south far south Texas today. And they were saying, oh, it's been 115, 116 degrees every day, which is just ridiculous. Um, but we're going to talk about what that means for our bees. Uh, just heat in general, summer dearth. We're going to cover varroa mite. We're going to talk about how to care for our bees post harvest. We're going to talk about uh, oh, well, a, a bunch of things. So, uh, but if we haven't met before, my name is Blake. I'm one of the owners of the Bee Supply, and I started keeping bees as a kid and grew it into from a from a hobby to a sideline business to a commercial business. And uh, we have about six different companies now in the beekeeping world, um, which could be a different webinar of one of these days. But uh, one of my favorite things to do is speak to all of you the first Thursday night of each month um, and in these monthly buzz webinars where we get to talk about practical beekeeping, what you need to be doing in your bees uh, this month to be a successful beekeeper. One quick thing that I want to plug before we dive into tonight's material is that we have a really special guest that I cannot wait to visit with. Uh, Mr. Ed uh, it, Jeff is a famous YouTube beekeeper and a really fascinating beekeeper. I love his YouTube channel. Um, check it out. I'm sure he'll uh, provide information on how to find that when we talk to him later tonight. But such a cool guy, and it's an honor to get him on our uh, webinar tonight. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have our normal live in the bee yard session like we always do. Then we'll talk practical beekeeping for about 20 minutes. And then we're going to save the last uh, 30 to 45 minutes of the webinar to have a Q&A with, with Mr. Ed. So start putting those questions you have in the Q&A box. If you have something you want to ask specifically to Mr. Ed, then you can put you know, save for Mr. Ed so that James and Sherry don't answer that in the Q&A box. And uh, I, I think there's no way we'll get through all the questions that I'm sure all of you will have, but we're going to give it our best shot. So uh, with that, let's jump into the material and oh, so a few quick reminders before we get too ahead of ourselves is um, we still have summer bees available. So if you were kind of late to the game getting into beekeeping this year, we have plenty of bees still available all throughout the summer. These are single story hives, complete hives. And the reason we don't sell nooks and packages this time of year is it's, it's too hard to get nooks and packages to grow enough in the summer months to get them to survive the winter. So you've really got to start with a complete hive this late in the year. So we still have those available. Uh, you can order them and pick them up anytime at uh, any of our stores. One other thing that I am super excited about, and we're going to get into this, well, right now, I'm going to talk a little bit about it, but the uh, these are what I consider the best supplements to use in the summer. These are two of my favorite supplements in general. Now, when we talk about supplements in the beekeeping world, you got to be careful. There's a lot of snake oil out there, and I would never tell you that you need to use really any supplement to be a successful beekeeper. So with that being said, there are tools that we can use in beekeeping to help our hives in certain circumstances. So we have a lot of tools in the tool belt of beekeeping, and the art of becoming a good beekeeper is learning how and when to use those tools to best uh, help your beehive to thrive. So there are very few things that we must do to keep our bees healthy. Kind of boils down to queens, varroa mites and nutrition. You know, if you get queens, varroa mites and nutrition right, you'll probably be a pretty successful beekeeper. There are other tools we can use to help in a lot of circumstances. These supplements are two of my favorite that are additional tools. Complete 
um, is really, and, and by the way, these are two things that commercial beekeepers use quite a bit. Now you might say, well, why do I care about that? Well, commercial beekeepers are running their, it's a business, right? I mean, they aren't going to invest money in things that don't yield a return, uh, that don't benefit the bees health. We can't, or we can't stay in business. So these are two supplements that are fairly widely used in the commercial world because they yield consistent results. There are a lot of products out there you're never going to see a commercial beekeeper touch because we kind of know professionally that, yeah, they really don't do anything. Um, that could be another webinar that I can get into one of these days, all the things not to buy. But these are two that are pretty accepted and, and pretty useful, complete does a pretty good job at eliminating dosema and boosting brood production significantly. It really increases brood viability. Um, it has about 157 ingredients, and we'll talk about when and how to use that later tonight. Apis Biologics is another one. Uh, Cayman Reynolds has named it Rocket Fuel, and so uh, that's kind of one of the names that's catching on. It really mimics the nutrients found in pollen and nectar. This guy spent a decade testing this, as a, as a beekeeper and trialing it for a decade with commercial small scale sideline beekeepers. And really what he worked to do is say, okay, when I'm feeding syrup um, or I'm feeding a pollen patty, what ingredients, what nutrients are missing that uh, would be found in natural nectar or natural pollen. And so those missing nutrients he put into Apis Biologics, that so you mix it with syrup when you feed it to bees and it kind of replicates natural nectar. So pretty cool stuff. This is when I recommend to use these products. Um, complete if you need your hive to grow. So if you're making summer splits, if your hive is on the weaker side and you need it to grow, increase brood production, complete does a pretty good job of helping bees grow. If you have brood issues, so if you're looking at your brood and it's twisted or yellowed or looks melted, um, you know, possible uh, brood issues, Complete does a pretty decent job of cleaning that up. If you have Nozema, by the way, Complete's a great, and this is a very, nat both of these are very natural products, non-chemical products. Uh, if you're in a drought or a dearth period, Complete works pretty well, um, and you can drench the hive with Complete uh, rather than putting it in a syrup. So if you've got a hive that doesn't need any more food, uh, Complete can be drenched over the hive, or it can be mixed with syrup. Apis Biologics, if you're trying to maintain hive strength, it can really help, it can help bees grow too. Uh, dearth or drought period, if you're feeding your bees, it's great to mix with syrup and it's a great supplement when you have a poor pollen or nectar flow. One other uh, quick product I wanna mention, we're getting uh, these in next week. So around the 15th, I think that's actually maybe next weekend or ish, these will be available in all our stores, but. We think that global pollen patties are the best pollen patties out there. And so what we've done is we've taken global pollen patties and we've mixed them with Apis Biologics or Complete. So you can buy the pollen patty with this stuff already mixed into it. So if you're feeding pollen patties during the summer dearth, you can buy it pre-mixed with those supplements in it. So we'll be sending out a big email with a ton of information on how to use it, what it's all about later. Uh, but we'll uh, we'll get into that. You'll, you'll see an email come out from us yeah, soon with all that information. But heads up, you guys get an early window into that. Sherry, I think you're on mute, but uh, you'll unmute yourself. I was waiting and for tell, you. Tell us about the magazine. I was waiting on you. I was waiting on you. Great. Um, so you couldn't hear James. He's already talking. We're already got lots of questions Go coming in. Go James. Awesome. <laughs> All right, so I couldn't help, it. this may look familiar, but it's not the same picture. Last, no, two years ago, we did a Gelardia photo. This one is just spectacular. I love it so much because that little girl is getting the pollen off her face. I just loved this photo, but this is a great issue. A lot of extraction info in there, kind of like we started off in last month. Those of you that are a little later, further north, that are going to be kind of August into an extraction, but this, put a pin in this one and reread it next month as well. Summer bee and beekeeper management, that's about us too. So y'all need to read that about staying uh, cool, not getting overheated. How much honey should I leave? Ready to, ready to harvest checklist? I love checklist. Robbing screen, super article by Lynn Jones and a lot, lot more. So slip that slide, please, Blake. And we're gonna go to my article spotlight. 
And I chose this because I have a little tool I want to show you. What to do if your harvested honey is high in moisture. And I'm sure that nobody out there has had that problem except me and James, right? Well, yeah, you have. The, the biggest issue about that is fermentation. And I want you to read the article. I'm not going to tell you too much, but you really have to address this. It's not something you can just close your eyes and it'll go away. Um, this is a refractometer. When I was a first beekeeper, I call it a refractometer. Isn't that what I call it? A refractometer. And everyone laughs. Just like you laughing. Anyway, it's a super handy tool. It's fairly inexpensive, but you once you buy one, you never have to buy one again. And I'm going to show you really quickly. If your honey is over 19%, you really ought to do something. Go buy the instructions that are in the article itself. But to test it, I have props here. So here's my refractometer. I've left it in the same room where my honey is. I've had it here all afternoon, so that's the same temperature. If you have a major difference, if this was in a cold room and your honey was in a warm room, then you're going to have a skewed reading. So the easiest way to do this is to get, thanks for making me big. <laughs> so the you're easiest welcome. Now way we can to see do better. <laughs> is to get a toothpick, because if you put too much on this little um, slide, it will make it fuzzy. Take it from me, it will make it fuzzy. So I just get a little tiny bit of honey and I put just one small drop on there. You see it's very small drop. And then I put the slide over it, push it down and you can see it kind of pressing and making a dark space. And then I'm gonna put it up to the light and I'm going to turn it until it's focused for me. I see that we're actually a little bit low. This is fresh honey. I'm at 16 and a half, maybe right at 17%. I could show you, but you wouldn't be able to see it. So I'm a little low. So there's a couple of things that obviously in the article about if you're too high, but I got a, I've got a, a quick little tip about if it's too low, because a couple of years ago, we did, a, we had some like 14% honey, and that's kind of like molasses. It's like silly putty. It was so thick. You can thin uh, thick honey. You do that with distilled water. And I still have my cheat sheet from what I used because we were very particular and did it very small increments. Don't quote me on this, but for to raise it 2%, which was where I was at one point, I added one tablespoon of distilled water to a pint of honey. So you'll need to do your calculations where you add just a small amount of distilled water and then recalculate re it, refigure it. Um, because you don't want it once you get too much water and you can't add any more. But anyway, uh, it's a great article, especially for all of us that have just extracted and you're pulling it. You've got buckets and buckets and buckets. And if you're like us, some of them, depending on what yard they came from, are this high in moisture and are this low in moisture. So I hope that helps somebody. Go to page 36 and 37 in this issue. Enjoy it. That's awesome. all I got. Thank you, Sherry. That was great. I love I love that. Super helpful. Okay, so guys, let's jump out into the bee yard. It was so hot in the bee yard. I went and filmed this yesterday. Uh, I, the only time I had yesterday was in the middle of the afternoon. So it was, it was I think, 102 degrees. So um, it is toasty out there. Uh, but let's, let's jump out and see what the bees are up to in uh, the middle of a really hot day. So... Let's share this and here we go. Hey, good evening everybody and welcome to the bee yard. As you can hear from the locusts in the trees, it is definitely summer. So we have entered kind of the dog days of summer in July. We're really gonna be focusing on uh, harvesting honey, how to take care of hives after you harvest, varroa mites, keeping hives cool, all those things that come with summer, uh, the, the temperatures of summer and the, the dog days of summer. So. Today in the bee yard, we're really gonna be looking at, you know, are these hives ready to harvest honey from? Last month, we really kind of got into how to get the honey off of the hives. So we're really not gonna get into that a whole lot. But we'll also talk a little bit about what to do with your bees after harvest. Um, how to take care of them, uh, what to give them, what not to give them, uh, uh, what uh, a hive inspection should look like over the summer. And then of course, most importantly, how to handle varroa mites, which we're gonna be getting into a lot more detail later tonight in the uh, PowerPoint portion of the webinar. But for now, I mean, it's hot out here, it's 100 degrees. 
Um, and, uh, but we'll, as we'll see, even at 100 degrees, these hives that have multiple boxes on them are still not having a problem staying cool. So really as a beekeeper, you don't have to worry about your bees too much, even in the heat with multiple boxes on the hive, they can still keep themselves cool. Where I get concerned with the heat is if I have single story hives that are weak and they're out in the full sun, they just start to melt. You certainly also do not want hives in nook boxes at all unless they're in the full shade. So if they're in a five frame nook box, get them into the full shade. If they're in a single story box, either add a second box or get them into the shade um, so they can really stay cool. But a good strong hive with multiple boxes on it, even in this extremely hot weather, they can get through the summer without much of a problem. So let's jump into the bee yard and see what we can find. Hey guys, so when we think about, you know, the summer and heat and bees, it's easy to get worried, especially if you live in the Southern United States, you know, where we routinely have daytime temperatures, 100 plus degrees, it's easy to worry about our bees. And that's somewhat appropriate. I mean, hot summers are really hard on bees, but it's not just the temperature that's the problem. Really, it's more the fact that there's not much blooming for our bees. So once the heat kills all the flowers, that's when I'm really way more concerned about my bees because they don't have much pollen or nectar coming in. The hives wanna start shutting down and varroa mites peak in the summer. And so I'm really way more worried about varroa mites and supplemental feeding if necessary than I am the heat per se. It's what comes along with the heat that's a problem. But one interesting thing that I wanted to show you guys is, you know, this is a really strong hive, multiple boxes on top. You can see that you've got, you know, bees kind of bearding out the front. Over here on this side, you've got bees just fanning like crazy. Um, and this is a hive with a screen bottom board. So I'm actually gonna get behind the camera, which is actually where I am uh, way more comfortable. Um, but, you know, I don't usually get to be behind the camera as much these days. Uh, and we're going to take a little bit of a closer look at the front of this hive to see what's going on here. So if you look a little more closely, you can see the hive, the, the bees on the right are just fanning like crazy. We've got some excess bees hanging out on the front, not too many. Um, and those are usually just foragers that are trying to stay out of the hive so the hive can stay cooler. Uh, and then, of course, we've got lots of fanning going on, but it's not chaotic. You know, I don't worry about a hive overheating unless I, it starts getting frenzied and chaotic uh, and huge beards hanging out the front. And that's when I'm more concerned. But I want to show you guys something to see if I can. Let's see if I can get under here and we can see it. But look at the underside of this hive through the screen bottom board. Um, let me see if I can get it to where you can see there's a lot of activity but not a lot of fanning. I mean, the bees are largely just fanning through the entrance of the hive. Um, they're not really fanning underneath the screen bottom board, which is interesting. That shows, you know, they're really not stressed. They're not overheating, lots of bee activity. Um, but, uh, you know, the fanning is pretty much just happening at the front of the hive. So I thought that was an interesting view. So, like I mentioned, you know, really this time of year, I'm way more worried about treating for varroa mites, making sure varroa mites are not an issue, making sure my hives have, you know, multiple boxes on top of them and that they have the food that they need. Uh, I'm way more worried about that than I am just the heat. My goal with this hive today is to decide, is it time to harvest honey or not? And, and I have not looked at this hive since well, really, since we looked at it last month. And so I'm gonna to try to see, okay, are we, are we ready to harvest honey? Now there's a variety of signs I look for when I'm trying to decide if it's time to harvest. One big one is just, what are the flowers blooming? So as you've been keeping bees for a while and as you talk to other beekeepers in your local area, you will begin to learn what flowers in your area are indicative of the major honey flow starting. And when those flowers stop blooming, pretty good sign that the flow is usually over. High honey, major honey flows usually follow a relatively stable pattern as well as far as dates. You know, where I live in North Texas, you know, I'm watching for the Gallardia or the Indian Blanket and I'm watching for the Scabiosa. And when those two start blooming, I know the flow, the major flow is beginning. 
when those are largely burned up and dried up, which is usually the last week of June, the first week of July, which is where we are now, I know the honey flow is about over. So that's one, one way to tell what's going on. The other is, of course, to look at your bees. And there is no substitute for just looking at your bees. And so I look at what's going on in the honey supers. And so here we've got, you know, this frame that we can see the bees are starting to cap the honey. Um, they haven't fully capped it yet, but they are capping, beginning to cap it. One interesting thing I watch out for is, and I'm not, I don't see it on this frame, but it's something I, I like to pay attention to and watch out for, is if I start seeing areas where the bees have started eating the nectar instead of storing it in the frame. So if I start seeing bald, bare patches where the bees have eaten the nectar back out of the frames, then I'm a little bit concerned because that tells me that instead of bringing a bunch of nectar in, the bees are now reversing and starting to eat uh, that nectar out of the hive. Um, and so that's a sign too that, hey, if you, you better get it harvested <laughs> before the bees uh, start eating all of it. Now you, uh, so I also am gonna do a shake test and I'm still getting some drips of honey out of these frames. So, you know, I would say that this isn't quite ready to harvest yet. And that's fairly consistent with the flowers that I'm seeing bloom as well. Even though it's been incredibly hot in Texas, I am still seeing scabios and Indian blanket hanging on because we have gotten really good rains. So we've, we've gotten great rain, it's hot, but those flowers are still holding on. Uh, that being said, most beekeepers can, you know, in, in Texas can harvest around the 4th of July pretty safely, you know, without the honey being too high of a moisture but on on you know if all the hives look like this and i can shake those upper frames and still get some decent nectar raining out of them you know i'll probably give it another week or so and and then plan on harvesting in about a week but our next box here you know very similar we've got some capped honey in this deep box but they are still working on capping but this bottom box this bottom honey super is much more filled out. You can see they've got most of the capping work done. So another, another week isn't gonna hurt anything uh, to let this hive sit before we harvest the honey. Hey guys, my goal with this video is to walk you through everything you need to do after you harvest honey to make sure that your hive is ready to survive the summer. Now this will look a little different depending on what part of the country you're in, but if you're a southern beekeeper and you harvest honey, you know, around the 4th of July, your bees have a long, hot summer to survive. If you're further north, um, you don't have quite as long after you harvest honey, uh, but you still have a lot to do to get your bees ready for winter in a short period of time. So let's say you've harvested your honey. You have, uh, when usually you pull the honey supers off, you leave your two brood boxes uh, on the hive. You pull all the honey supers above off, you extract the honey, you store those honey supers, you know, using wax moth crystals after you extract the honey out of them. Uh, but you still have these two boxes left. So within about a week of after I harvest honey, the first thing I'm going to do is go assess my hive. So I'm going to see what I've got. Now this doesn't have to be a long ins inspection. It's hot outside. Um, so I usually recommend doing an inspection first thing in the morning. Uh, or in the evening, you know, when it's cooler for your sake and the bee's sake. You may notice when you go through your hive, especially if it's in the hotter part of the day, like, hey, where's all my bees? When it gets really hot, the bees tend to stay in the lower boxes or they may be out foraging, uh, but there is often a big difference in how many bees there are in the box, you know, right first thing in the morning. Uh, or really, really late in the evening versus the heat of the day. I've seen hives that I'm like, oh my goodness, my bees are all gone in the middle of a hot day. And then I go out at 6 a.m. in the morning right at sunup and there's a box completely full of bees. So, you know, population is kind of a hard thing to judge in the heat. But I'm just gonna really quickly just, I'm gonna pull some of the center frames out. I'm not really gonna inspect every frame. I wanna get a feel for two things. One, I wanna see how much honey they have in their top and bottom boxes, just roughly. 
and I want to see how much brood they have and what the brood is looking like. So this hive, I'll show you this frame, it looks pretty good. I'm pretty happy with it so far. We've got several of these frames up in the top box where you've got, let's see if I can get it to where the sun is shining correctly, but you've got this frame where you've got all this capped honey along this edge. You've got a bunch of cat brood in the middle. There's eggs and larva all in the center. So this is just kind of a classic healthy frame that I'm excited to see. I mean, again, we've got honey around the edges. We've got brood in the middle. Um, I'm not seeing any warning signs. We've got, you know, and again, I'm doing this inspection in the middle of a hot day. But I've got, you know, this top box is two thirds full of bees. So we've got a decent bee population, even though it's the heat of the day. I've got about three frames of brood up in the top box. The queen is still laying. Um, I'm not seeing a tremendous amount of pollen, but I am seeing some, you know, there is still some flowers blooming. You can see around this brood, see if I can get it to where you can see it. All around this brood, we've got pollen. So if you see that cat brood in the middle there, if you look around the edge, we've got pollen. So the cat brood is in the center of the frame there. And then you've got the cap, uh, the, I'm sorry, the pollen around the edge. And then you've got some cap honey on the lower right side of the frame there. So, you know, we've got some pollen, not a ton, which I wouldn't expect to see a ton of pollen this time of year. The next thing I'm gonna do is just kind of hoist up on this box where I'm gonna take it off to get a feel for how much honey is in there. And it's totally a guess, but I would say there's about 20 pounds of honey in that box. Bottom box is pretty much completely full of bees, exactly what I want to see. So I've got, you know, roughly two boxes full of bees. I'm going to take a quick look down below. I really don't have a lot of honey in the bottom box. You know, these outside frames are pretty empty. They've got you know, a little bit of honey, but not a lot. And then I've got lots of brood. You know, I've got a lot more brood and a lot less honey. So this is what most of the frames look like in the bottom box. You can see this is just a frame completely full of brood, which is good. It's good, healthy brood. Lots of great cat brood. I'm seeing it on both sides. What I'm not seeing a lot of down here though, is I'm not seeing uh, hardly any honey. So this is a pretty robust, healthy hive with about 20 pounds of honey stored up in the top box, maybe one frame of honey in the bottom box. So they aren't starving, but I can also tell you that they are not going to have enough honey to make it all the way until a fall honey flow. So this hive, I'm not, I wouldn't want to give this hive or any hive just gallons and gallons of syrup in the middle of the summer because what that's going to do is it's going to cause them to um, store all that honey in with all the brood and the queen's going to run out of areas to lay. So what I do this time of year is I trickle feed. So I take small amounts of syrup and I give them a little bit of syrup every seven to ten days, you know, about three quarters. I'm sorry, about a third or so a gallon of syrup um, every seven to 10 days. Now, if you live a long way from your bees, just, you know, you can give them, you know, a full gallon of syrup, come back in two or three weeks, give them another full gallon. That's okay too. But giving them small amounts over a longer period of time encourages that queen to keep laying. It keeps the hive from getting honey bound. Um, and it gives them that trickle to keep their uh, brood rearing up during the summer. Now, um, again, if you live a long way from your bees, just give them enough to try to maintain 20 to 30 pounds of stores in your second box. And that's really my goal. I don't want them to fill up the second box completely full of honey or syrup. I just want them to stay in that 20 to 30 pound range, which is, you know, uh, five, six, five or six deep frames uh, full of, mostly full of honey or syrup. Once they start dropping really below that for a strong hive like this, um, they were really going to start shutting down that queen more severely. 
and it's okay for them to shut down some. We don't need them to be as strong because the honey flows over. But we don't want them to shut down too dramatically, too hard, um, or the fall is going to get here um, and they're going to shut down even further and you might have a hive that dwindles too much over, over the hot summer and into the fall. So I'm, I'm trying to keep my bees kind of stable at this same spot, at the same level uh, throughout the summer. Summer is tough on bees. I mean, it just is. If this was, you know, in the south, I should say. I mean, if, if you know, my bees that are up in North Dakota right now, I'm not really that worried about them. It's 75 degrees and there's a great pollen flow, <laughs> you know. Um, so I'm not as worried about them. But in the south, you know, when it's so hot and all the flowers burn up, we have to pay a little more attention to our bees to try to keep them healthy throughout the summer. So, um, and again, I always tell people, some people say, oh, you don't, you know, you don't need to feed your bees. Feeding hurts your bees. Uh, you know, you can just pull your honey and leave them be. Well, try it on a couple hives. So take a couple of your hives, harvest the honey, um, and don't feed. And then take a couple hives and do feed. Run your own little experiment and see how it works. Um, I find that a trickle feed of a hive uh, throughout the summer is going to greatly, greatly benefit them. So this hive, it looks really good. The brood looks good. The next thing I'm going to do is a varroa mite test on them. So the population is good, but I'm going to either use a sticky board um, that's going to insert underneath the screen. You can put it, if you have a screen bottom board, it can in insert uh, underneath the screen here, or it can insert in the front of the hive, um, right inside the entrance. Um, and I have a whole nother video on how to test for varroa mites using this sticky board. And um, I will uh, link to that. So you'll, if you look in the description of this video, um, you will see the link to that on YouTube. I'll link to the other video. Um, and if you're watching this on our monthly buzz, I'll send it out in the email follow up. So you can use this to, to test varroa mites or you can use the Varroa Easy Test alcohol wash. And I, I thought I had one in my truck and, and I just dug through my truck and I apparently didn't have it. But I'll, I'll also link to the video on how to do an alcohol wash using the Varroa Easy Check. It's really easy. Um, and so there's two different methods you can use to test your hive for Varroa mites. That's the next step after my initial assessment. Now, keep in mind, you don't have to, you don't have to test every single hive you have for Varroa mites. I usually test, you know, two or three hives in my apiary. And as long as I'm getting consistent results from those two or three hives, that's pretty much what all your hives are gonna be at. So, you know, if I'm getting three mites per hundred bees on every single test and three different hives, my whole apiary is pretty much guaranteed to be the same. So you don't have to test every single hive. Um, so test for, for varroa mites. Most hives need some varroa mite treatment in July or August. I'm going to use this time of year, um, Apivar. So this is Apivar, uh, and then, or I'm going to use Apigard. So I'm going to use the Apigard if I have a higher varroa mite infestation. I'm going to use the Apivar if I have a lower varroa mite infestation. So if I have, you know, four, five, six varroa mites per 100 bees, I'm going to use the Apigard because it works a little bit faster. If I just have, you know, two or three varroa mites per 100 bees, I'm going to use the Apivar. It works a little bit slower. So you can kind of pick based on your varroa mite levels. That's why that test is, is so important. Um, everyone should test before they treat for varroa mites. Um, I understand that there are some folks that aren't going to test. If you are just dead set against testing, I would probably go with the Apiv Apigard. Assume you have a little bit strong, higher mite population. Uh, and it's a little bit more of a natural treatment. Um, but again, at least test with the sticky board. Literally all you have to do is slide it in the entrance of your hive uh, and you're done. Come back in 24 hours and count the varroa mites on the sticky board. Again, watch my video on it, but it's so, so easy. There's no excuse for not doing at least a sticky board test. It's not as accurate as the alcohol wash, but at least do this. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna treat my hive for varroa mites. And again, I have videos on how to use both those products. I'll include those links as well. And then when I do feed this hive, I'm gonna do a couple different things. Um, I am going to, uh, during the summer, I'm going to use the Apis Biologics. 
uh, mixed in with the syrup. Now this tiny little package can make like 50 gallons of sugar water. Uh, and it's just a supplement. And this is super simple stuff, but what it does, and I'm, I'm a believer in this stuff. I have other videos on it. It's not a snake oil thing at all. This, this is a very smart beekeeper and scientist that developed this. And um, he spent a decade perfecting it. A lot of commercial beekeepers use it, especially in Canada. Um, so it's a very fascinating product. And what it essentially does is it mimics the nutrients in natural pollen and natural nectar. And so when you add this to your sugar water, it's creating a blend that is much, much closer to real nectar, which is so much better for bees than just syrup. So adding this as you trickle feed your bees over the summer is such a good idea. The other thing I really love is Complete. Complete, and I'll get a little closer on this. I love this product as well. Um, and Complete, it does something similar to the Apis Biologics. You can use this too over the summer. Um, you can mix it in with syrup. You can mix it with pollen patties. Uh, I really, really like this, especially going into the fall, and it just cleans up your bee's gut going into winter. Um, you can also drench this, so you can mix it with sugar water and drench your bees with it. But again, um, this, there's really great instructions on this little bottle if you buy it. So definitely, as you're feeding over the summer, use one of these two products. This one is my slight favorite in the heat of the summer, and then this one is my favorite uh, going into the fall. Um, the last thing I would recommend is if you're trying to really grow your bees, so if your hive is weak and you feel like you need to grow it, uh, the Complete can help stimulate brood production and help grow your bees. And then I'll talk about it I, I, um, elsewhere, but we also are selling pollen, global pollen patties, which is the best pollen patty on the market in my opinion, mixed with, uh, we, have, we sell one mixed with Apis Biologics and we sell one mixed with Complete Bee. So you can also just buy a pollen patty mixed with this stuff and give it straight to your hive, which again is really great for your bees over the summer. Some years it's more beneficial than others. If you're in an area that's kind of in a drought and you aren't seeing many flowers blooming, then giving them that pollen patty, which gives them protein, mixed with one of these two supplements is just going to keep the hive strong throughout the, throughout the summer. So first thing you do on a hive is assess Test for varroa mites, apply your varroa mite treatment, trickle feed, um, and then you're gonna maintain that trickle feed of my preference is about, again, about a third or so gallon of syrup every seven to 10 days, a half a pound to a one pound of pollen patty every seven to 10 days, and you'll carry that up into the early fall. And then uh, the rules change a little bit in early fall. So check back in with us then, and we'll talk about what to do with your bees through the early fall. But this is what you need to do to get your bees through July, through August, through September, during those crazy hot days. So there you have it, guys. All right, so let's jump back over to our July monthly tip. So I'm gonna just take about uh, 15 minutes or so, and we're gonna go over some really practical tips, and then we're going to get to Q&A with uh with mr ed so we're going to wrap up this portion and then go to what you've all been waiting for which is the which is the q a portion so um one thing i always mention is when we talk about caring for our bees after harvest we're talking about winter preparation now i know it doesn't feel like <laughs> it doesn't feel like we're anywhere close to winter it's 100 plus degrees outside but as soon as you harvest your honey as beekeepers, we're focusing on winter preparation. That's when winter preparation begins. So everything we're doing, we're thinking ahead to how to get our bees ready for winter. This year, a lot of areas are seeing some pretty nice summer blooms. That looks like all sorts of things, depending on where you are in the country. But uh, there's a lot of decent summer blooms because we've had a little more rain this year. I was in uh, Nova Scotia with my wife and kids. We went on vacation a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the first six months out of the year are just ridiculously busy as a beekeeper and can't even take any days off. And so right when our crazy busy season ends, which is usually late June, uh, we try to go on a vacation. So we, uh, we'd we never been to Nova Scotia, so we went to Nova Scotia. Most of the days were in the 60s or 70s, and it's so interesting because spring is just starting that far north. You know, these are the flowers I saw blooming. You know, they've got 
similar flowers, interestingly, lots of white ball clover, purple clover, vetch uh, was blooming. And uh, it was just, yeah, I mean, it was interesting. Spring was just getting started up there. Didn't see a lot of bees up there. These are our bees in North Dakota right now. Again, up in North Dakota, spring is just starting. You know, this is a canola field. A beautiful, beautiful, uh, vibrant yellow, fantastic pollen, awesome honey. Uh, spring is just starting up there. So it depends a lot on where you are. Oh, I just, I want to play this video really quickly. Oops. Well, I said I was going to play it. Uh, hmm. Nope. Well, it was a guy doing a shake test. It was a cool video. I'll try to put it on YouTube and attach it to our follow-up email that goes out. It was, a, it was a guy doing a shake test a couple of weeks ago and the nectar was just raining out of the cells. So kind of like the hive we saw in the bee yard. Wasn't quite ready to harvest yet. Some areas, if you do that shake test, you'll be able to, nothing's gonna come out. Uh, a lot of areas have already harvested their honey. Others haven't quite yet. I do want to take a quick poll. So in June, if you remember, we did a poll where we asked, I asked, um, how is your honey harvest shaping up? Better than normal, normal, worse than normal. And these are the statistics that we saw. In June, 45% of people said their flow, they thought was going to be, their harvest was going to be better than normal. 41% said normal. 14% said worse than normal. And I made the point that, um, you know, it, it often, um, we often think that it's, it's going to be better than it is as we kind of go halfway, you know, halfway through the flow, everything looks awesome because uh, we're kind of assuming that it has a few weeks left of great uh, or equivalent honey flow. And then sometimes it doesn't always shape up to be quite as good as we thought it would be. So I, I want to do the same poll now that probably a lot of you have actually harvested um or are really close to harvesting you know how is your harvest or your projected harvest shaping up so it looks like um i, I was sort of right but uh not not terribly um 40 percent 40 percent of you said that your harvest or projected harvest is better than normal 43 percent said normal and 16% said worse than normal. So what that tells me is you guys are really good at projecting what your harvest is going to look like. Because again, that pretty closely matches our poll a whole month ago. Uh, so yeah, you guys are awesome at projecting. So not bad. I mean, combined, 83% of you are saying that your harvest or projected harvest is better than normal or normal. Only 16% of you are saying worse than normal. So not bad overall for, you know, that, that's not bad at all. We've certainly have had worse years. One other, oops, one other poll I want to shoot to you guys really quickly, because this is something that um, a lot of you ask. If I can get to it here. Here we go. A lot of you ask is, what should I be charging for my honey? So I just thought I'd do this poll real quickly and ask you guys, what do you charge per pound when you're selling honey? A lot of new beekeepers ask, well, what should I be charging per pound for honey? I thought we'd do a quick poll and uh, see what most of you are charging per pound for your honey. So you can uh, fill out there or, or select what you're charging. Interesting. So nobody so far is charging under five $5 a pound. Thank goodness your honey is worth so much more than that. 5% of you charge between five and $7 a pound. 32% of you charge between eight and $10. That's by far the majority. No, uh, that's not actually the majority. Okay. It's shifting a little bit. All right. I think we're stable now. 31% eight to $10. 23%, 11 to $13, 30%, 14 to $16, and 8% over $17 a pound. So I'll read that really quickly again. 6%, 5 to $7, 33%, 8 to $10, 23%, 11 to 13, 30%, 14 to 16, and then 8% over $17 a pound. So there you go. Do not charge under eight. That's kind of the minimum there. But a lot of you are getting $14 to $16 a pound, which is fantastic. All right, so let's keep rolling here. This is the drought map for July of 2023. So that we always, you know, I like showing this because it, it kind of tells you like if you're in a drought area, 
you probably need to be focusing a little bit harder on uh, maybe some pollen substitute this time of year, maybe using that Apis Biologics or Complete. Uh, you know, you, if you're in a major drought area, that means you're probably not getting the pollens coming in that non-drought areas are. So, you know, pay attention to this map. It gives you clues, not, it's not always definitive, but it gives you clues as to how you need to be uh, taking care of your bees nutritionally over the summer. Now, just for uh, grins, here's the map from July of 2022. So July of last year, here's the map. Certainly worse last year than this year, but uh, there are areas that are, uh, you know, pretty rough this year as well. So just an interesting comparison. Something I'm certainly seeing uh, is summer brood. I expect to see brood in my hive get a little more spotty over the summer. That's pretty common. Uh, brood patterns tend to not be as compact and beautiful as you go into summer. That's normal. What we really pay attention to this time of year is varroa mites. Varroa mites populations typically peak in July, August, and September. It's the leading cause of winter death, and that's in air quotes because a lot of people get to the winter months and they're like, why did my hive die? Usually, it starts when your varroa mite levels get high over the summer, and they don't usually kill a hive just outright. Usually, you see that hive strength start to diminish over time slowly, and it finally dies in the winter. But if you don't get ahead and stay ahead of varroa mites, it's going to cause long-term issues in your hives. Assume your beehive has varroa mites. Every hive in the country more or less has varroa mites. Visual inspection is pointless. Don't look at your bees and say, well, I don't see varroa mites. Um, that's not good enough. You're typically not going to see them. They're usually lodged underneath your bee's uh, stomach. We do have, we could spend all night talking about varroa mites and how to deal with them. I'm going to just pitch. We have a class available on our website. If you go to our advanced classes, it's a two hour course on how to handle varroa mites naturally and or chemically. So it kind of goes over all the different options. If you're new to beekeeping, confused by how to deal with varroa mites, go check out that class. Hive growth trends. This is just what I typically see. You know, we see our beehives really peak in strength usually May, June. They start dropping down a little bit over the summer months. Um, and as they shrink a little bit, because they don't need to be quite as big and strong when there's not a lot of honey coming in. Again, this is going to vary a little bit. You know, if you're in Minnesota, the honey flow is really just now kicking into gear, and you're going to maintain that strength through July, and it'll probably start dropping down a bit in August. Um, but, uh, but in general, this is kind of the flow that we see in high strength. Interestingly, you also see a slightly lagging a uh, uh, graph when it comes to varroa threat or varroa levels in a hive. We typically see as the hive is building up in strength, so is the varroa mite levels. And then it peaks July, August, September, and those numbers start declining as your hive dies. <laughs> so uh, we really have to pay attention to varroa mites in, in these summer months. These are some of the visual signs of varroa mites. Again, you can't rely on it. If you see crazy spotty brood, Bees pulling out a lot of pupa from your hive, the crumpled up wings on your bees, or you're seeing varroa mites and drone brood, those are all signs of a severe infestation, possibly one that's going to be hard to recover from. You want to be testing for varroa mites as soon as you harvest honey. That should be your first thing you do. Harvest honey, same week. Go through that inspection routine I talked about out in the bee yard. Inspect, test for varroa mites if needed, treat. Um, et cetera. Testing, I talked about out, out in the bee yard already, so I'm not going to cover that. Um, I'm, okay, so here are some QR codes for you guys to scan. We don't have time to cover this in this webinar, but scan these QR codes. It's going to take you to a video that shows you how to test for varroa mites with a sticky board and how to test for varroa mites using an alcohol watch. An alcohol wash is more uh, accurate, but it also kills the bees. Uh, the sticky board works, but isn't quite as accurate. But this video goes over all that. I'll also include this in, um, in I'll also link to these in the follow-up email and in the YouTube video. I'll put these links down below. Here's another one for how to treat with Apivar and how to treat with Apigard. So if you wanna use one of these two treatments, I did a video yesterday out in the bee yard 
We just don't have time to play it today, but you can also scan these QR codes um, and I will include links to those in, in all the after show notes as well. And if you haven't had time to scan it, don't worry, you can go back and watch the recording and, and scan these as well. I'm gonna speed up just a little bit here uh, so that we have plenty of time for Mr. Ed. A couple of really quick things, adding boxes during the summer, when should you stop adding supers? Well, stop adding supers when you're within about a week of the main honey flow ending. So if you've only got about a week of the main honey flow left, that's usually when you want to stop adding supers. If your hive never grew beyond one deep box full of bees, then I do like adding a second box during the heat of the summer if you're in the southern U.S. Just gives them a heat barrier, barrier even if they don't need the space. It gives them a heat barrier, keeps them a little cooler through the summer. If both of your brood boxes are just jam packed full of bees this time of year, I also like to give them a third box. Again, just creates a bit of that heat barrier. Keep in mind what do bees need to grow and thrive? They need protein or pollen. They need a variety of pollen. They need carbs. They need to be largely mite free, two mites per hundred bees or less, largely free of brood disease, healthy, vibrant queen. That's the ingredients for success. So if you're, if, 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 if all of this seems overwhelming and there's so many options, focus on these things. This is what your beehive needs to successfully survive the summer. And I'll go over this in a little bit more detail in just a second. Um, I'm gonna skip through some of that. Um, one thing to watch out for is well-fed versus overfed bees. So the picture on the right is well-fed, kind of what we saw in that video out in the bee yard, right? We've got this brood in the middle, a good band of honey around the outside edge versus this frame on the left, we fed it so much that the bees have just kind of filled in all the extra space in the brood nest with nectar or syrup if we're feeding, and now the queen doesn't have anywhere to lay. So what I like to do to combat this is I like to do trickle feeding in the summer, which is when I'm feeding small amounts of pollen and feeding small amounts of sugar syrup over the duration of the summer. And I talked about that out in the bee yard, but this is what it looks like. And it's part of making sure the beehive has the proper nutrients going through the summer. So feeding pollen substitute, you know, feeding two one pound pollen patties per month. Um, don't feed more pollen than can be eaten in a week. And then feeding a fourth to a half a gallon per week if until the hive has 30 pounds of stores. So this is what I roughly follow. You know, again, you can feed a little bit less. It doesn't have to be every week. It could be every 10 days, uh, but giving them a little bit of nutrients throughout the summer uh, can be helpful. Now, the caveat is some summers are more critical than others. You know, if you're not in a drought area, you can probably be a little more lax on this. If you are in a drought area, you've got to pay closer attention because the bees could really be short on nutrients. Um, especially pollen substitute, you know, it's really insurance in my mind. So summer care, this is kind of the recipe to follow. Maintain 20 to 30 pounds surplus of syrup or honey in the second brood box. 30 pounds is one medium box, 90% full or one deep box, two thirds full. Test for varroa mites now, treat if needed. Feed one to two pollen patties per month. I'll add the caveat, especially if you're in a drought area. If you're not in a drought area, probably not that big of a deal. Feed complete or apis biologics, and then equalize brew between hives if needed. Again, the two things that are, yeah, maybe not quite as critical there would be po pollen patties and complete or apis biologics. But again, do it on half your bees. Don't do it on the other half and see who comes out ahead. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, it's a cool concept. If you want to draw out foundation for next year, now that your honey harvest is done, you can um, add a box of foundation to a really, really, really strong single story hive and get them to draw out your beeswax for next year by feeding them over the summer and feeding them complete bee at the same time. They will draw out your foundation for next year. So you can watch the recording and come back and look a little more closely at this slide um, next time. Uh, and, and we may get into this a little bit more in August. We don't have quite as much to cover in August. So I may try to jump back into this one in a bit more detail in August. Keeping your hives cool, green bottom boards help. An empty box on top of your hive helps. Partial shade in the afternoon helps. Uh, giving your bees an upper air ventilation helps. 
But again, like we saw in the video, a good strong high with at least two boxes should be able to handle the heat uh, without much of a problem. Um, okay, last thing before we get to Mr. Ed, um, post-harvest super care. Uh, don't forget to take care of your comb after you harvest honey. Uh, you can put it in a freezer or use wax moth crystals. I do want to throw this product out. Uh, we just This just hit our website today, but we just developed a big bag uh, that you can store up to six honey supers in, um, and it zips up around the honey supers, uh, and you can put your wax moth crystals inside, and it keeps them perfectly airtight. Uh, and and uh, or you can freeze your supers for 24 hours to kill any uh, wax moth larvae, and then put them in this airtight zipper bag that we develop, and then you don't have to worry about uh, treating them with wax moth crystals throughout the whole year. So we'll send an email out about it. I'll I'll include it uh, in the after show notes. Uh, but it's a pretty cool invention, and and literally I got the text during the webinar that, that hey we just got this product on the website, so uh, we'll we'll send an email out about it. Okay, so with that, finally the moment you've been waiting for, I'm going to turn it over to Sherry. Um, Sherry is going to introduce uh, Mr. Ed, and then um, we're going to open it up to questions uh, for all of you can, can ask Mr. Ed um, and, and myself, and Sherry's going to kind of moderate the discussion, uh, and we'll go from there. So Sherry, uh, take it away. Just call me Barbara Walters. <laughs> no, I'm joking. That was a good before that came from. So, uh, Jeff, Mr. Ed, could you show your face, please? Put your video on and give us some sound. I um uh, I'm super stoked about having Jeff with us, aka Mr. Ed, because I met him at the Texas. Texas Beekeepers Association Summer Clinic, and super personable guy. He uh, lives in South Louisiana. If I have to, I might have to, un let's see, ask him to unmute. There he goes. All right. Now we got to see your face, Jeff, and we'll have I'm you. I'm working on it. Okay, you're good. You're good. I'm on an issue. So, well, no, I can't see your face, but you keep working <laughs> on it, and I'll keep talking about you. Um, <laughs> so, um, I kind of, I'm with Blake, I, I have seen many a uh, Jeff Horchoff, Mr. Ed videos, but I've never met him until a few weeks ago. Super, super nice guy. And, uh, people just flock to him as, as evidence of his 137,000 followers on Facebook, I mean, on, uh, YouTube. So he, he didn't just poof overnight, come come here. So um, he is the lone bee wrangler for a group of Benedictine monks at the St. Joseph Abbey in Southeast Louisiana, which is super cool. And he is very proud to talk about that when given the opportunity. In 2016, they lost 30 hives, which was all they had at that, um, at that abbey. And he had to make the decision whether we're going to rebuild all this or we're going to just throw in the towel. Well, he decided to rebuild it. And now they have, um, they're fluctuating between 200 and 150 hives, which is pretty big task for he and another fellow that um, partners with him uh, making videos. So Jeff, can you find your little button to have your video or no? So, I don't hey, know. No, I don't know. I don't know where it is. Okay, let's see. Um, it should be on the bottom left, second from the so, second from the left, right, right beside. It should say, let's see, should say video. Well, let's just start. You'll find it. And, and Jeff, I it? just made you a. Um... I just made you a co-host. It may have been that for some reason, as a panelist, it wasn't letting you have that option. I don't. It, it should have. Oh, but... There we go. There he oh, is. Now we got it. Yeah, Jeff, Miss Red. Um, first thing I want to ask, like I want to ask Jeff, how did you come up with Mister Ed? Where did that come from? Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute. Unmute yourself. 
There we go. It. Okay. There we go. So the, the, the name Mr. Ed uh, came from when I was a mailman. That was that was the name that was given to me when I started working at the post office in Mandeville 20 uh, in 1984. Oh, wow. And uh, so everybody, when they walked into the post office, they get a name. And my, my last name being Horchoff, there's always been that extrapolation of horse trough. And so even <laughs> in high school, I was called trough in high school. And uh, <laughs> And then when I when I got to the post office with my name Horse Horchoff, and then of course you know these nice snags, you know everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I do like it. I, I do have a tendency to talk a lot. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a it. great story. <laughs> that's a that's great, great story. That's awesome. Well, <laughs> and then then when I started my YouTube, because I, I I'd grown to love the name so much, I said I'm just call myself Mr. Ed. <laughs> no. Well, people love that. It's a very endearing, um, very endearing thing to, to have a nickname, first of all. I won't even go up to mine or, you know. <laughs> hey, you. <laughs> well, what's James showing me? Are you showing me questions? questions. Okay, well, I got them right here. Yeah, well, I, before before we say anything, I, I can't believe that, that Blake, you were trying to say, like, this is going to be the, the highlight of the evening. I, I That's, <laughs> that's, um, uh, that's a reach, I think, for you to say that. I, you did a really great job. I love your 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 work out in the bee yard. It's very very helpful to a lot of of um, newbies for for sure. You know. Um, well, thank you. I I appreciate that. And and no, it is it is the highlight. I wanted. I don't I don't know that we've ever crossed paths. Uh, no, in, I've never met in, you. in in out in the wild. Um, I love the bee. I love you all. I loved you. I've always respected your work, and I love your YouTube channel. And well, how uh, how can you say I work? I mean, you work bees. I I don't. <laughs> I just like I have bees. <laughs> well, the, no, actually, the uh, the video I just watched recently was you extracting all day long uh, your your harvest. I think it was about a year ago. And I man, I tell you, there is nothing I hate more than extracting. Um, uh -huh. I will I will pull honey all day long in a hundred degree weather before I go extract honey. So. Uh, that, right. man that's work <laughs> that's, the, that's the easiest part especially oh, when you're 20 so people helping you <laughs> well that does help uh, <laughs> but, hard but no no it's it is a highlight to meet you and, and I, I i've been to louisiana many times at their their state association meetings and stuff like that but uh one one day i'd love to about oh yeah we'll, we'll 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 our paths will cross i'm sure fantastic. i'd like to meet you Wait. yes that's yes. awesome yeah, well, Jeff tra is traveling to be in uh, Quincy, Illinois next week. Isn't that right? right? Next week we go to That's Quincy. Awesome. Yeah, I'm looking That's forward awesome. to that. There's, yeah. there's always something going, and Blake's doing this one, and Mr. Ed's doing this one. I'm sure y'all will meet that. Well, let's get to a few questions. So I've dismissed a couple that were early on that, um, and I, I really don't. The, the first one just made us laugh. So we had to share it. So that <laughs> get ready. It says, um, <laughs> My honey smells like ammonia. Cat pee. Is there anything I can do to fix it? Yeah, feed it to the bees. <laughs> <laughs> They're the ultimate filter. <laughs> yeah. Good but, Jeff, I, I am curious though, I'm kind of with that. I mean, because you're you're what remind what part of Louisiana are you in? Are you near the, near the I'm, coast I'm, or I'm more about 50 miles of north of New Orleans? Okay. So, so how how do you handle high moisture honey? Because I'm, I'm guessing that's, you know, if you extract too soon, I'm, I'm guessing that's a potential problem in your area. Do, is that an issue you run into? If so, how, well, do, you, how do you handle our, it? Our honey house, it's conditioned to begin with, but that's that's irrelevant. When, when you're dealing with humidity that's running 80, 90% every day, it doesn't really matter. So that this year when we when we brought in our supers, uh, and I and I checked the humidity in the room. It was seventy six percent in the in the room. So I run a dehumidifier in the room as I'm bringing in my my supers. Um, and I, I didn't. And I, I love to show your your refractometer. <laughs> I'm a guy. I got to get me one of those things because I'd love hey, to I'm know. Right. <laughs> I I, I'm, I I would have loved to know what ours was this year because it was like ninety weight oil. Um, this, oh wow! It was super, super thick. Um, but on the other hand, too, I, I think this was our, our our best 
tasting honey ever. Um, mm. and, and I think, I think it's, it's due to the fact that our tallow, which was wiped out, which is our main um, nectar, um, you, you were asking for your, the, the, the poll on um, your honey harvest being what percentage of it were ours. We, last year, well, the year before, when we had 200 hives, we did uh, about 6,000 pounds of honey. And then that, but it's just me and Charlie working this and Charlie's older than me. So it's just, it's just too much. So we scaled down 150 hives. That's all we want. So 150 hives. And last year we, we, we did, uh, we did um, 4,200 pounds. So we dropped down significantly, but it, it, it was, it was manageable. That's manageable for two people. And so th this year, it started out February, it was just gangbusters. I mean, the bees were just pumping bees out like crazy, but they, it was so weird as they, they didn't make swarm cells. They weren't gonna swarm, they were just making bees, filling up the boxes with bees, but no swarm cells. And I love making my splits using my swarm cells. And so I, out of the 150 hives, I split probably about 85 of them, 85 or 90 of them that I split. And out of those 85 or 90, um, I only used swarm cells like on three or four of them. Everything mm -hmm. else was getting double screen boards. So I was really excited about it because I was able to split our, our hives. I was finished our splits and with double supers on them at the beginning of March. It was like, usually I'm starting middle of March and I'm already finished. And my numbers of bees are really growing. I said, man, it's like I was spot on for like a super harvest this year. And, and then around the 20th of March, right as our, our tallow was coming into in its new growth, we got hit with a really weird cold snap and it killed everything. It killed everything. Yeah. That, that was bad enough. But then our privet, which is our, our early... Um, late March, early May blow, that was there, but there was no nectar to it. Fortunately, we had a great, another great year with blackberries and, and blueberries. They, the, they bloomed, but they did not um, go to fruit because they got caught in that um, freeze as well. So what happened this year, because we've already finished our, our harvest and we, we, <laughs> I'm embarrassed. We we only have 80 gallons of honey. That's all oh, we got. No. About 85 oh, no. gallons. So it's like wow. it was. I had 20 boxes. Is what what we had. Where last year we had 95 boxes. This year we had mm. 20. But I still have uh, uh, five drums of honey from two years ago. So we'll still. All I all I try to do is keep. I don't sell honey to the public. It's just sold through our gift shop. And, and so my whole goal for the Abbey Honey program is to supply honey to the gift shop all year round. If I can do that, I, I, I'll succeed in, in trying to achieve our goals. So we'll still, being able to use the um, honey from two years ago, we'll still be able to supply that demand. And I mean, Blake, as you know, beekeeping, they don't classify bees as livestock for nothing because it's farming. And in farming, you're at the, the whim of nature and you know what God does. And you just have to work with that and be thankful for everything you get. And, and really, I, I am thankful because uh, unlike you, Blake, uh, I really am not a beekeeper. I, I, I just kind of have bees, like I say. And I, I allow the bees to take care of themselves. I, I, don't, I don't spend the time that you spend with your bees. I don't spend that time. Uh, I, I've actually, even though I'm retired, I, I really enjoy my life. <laughs> and so I'm not, I don't, it's not a job for me. I, I love doing it, but I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not forced to have to do it. And so I let the bees alone. Uh, uh, you have some great tips on after heart. I, really, it's almost like, man, I, I ought to do some of that. And then I think, man, if I did that, I'd have to work. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Jeff, it sounds like you retired like James retired. So he plays with beads now. Yeah, it, it's so it. much funner if you yeah, can just play is. with them than have to, oh my gosh, am I going to be able to pay my electric bill this <laughs> month with them? <laughs> get a couple of questions that's so good Jeff that is just so good all of that I just I just love that um I want to ask since we're talking about honey let me ask this question real quick um from Mike my honey seems a bit thin and very pale any thoughts or concerns it's my first year and the bees are in southwest Oklahoma either one of you got any input on that I could say something. Please, Jeff. Yes. It, look, it's the honey that the bees produced. Let it go. <laughs> That's, just be happy with that. I, I, I'm always, that, that's one thing I, I never have, have questioned. It, it's what do the bees produce? It, this, this, it's a, for me, it's a God thing. And I just, I, I let the bees do what bees are supposed to do. And I don't want to manipulate it. I don't want to interfere with it, but I still want some of that honey. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's so true. That's so true. I'm, I'm curious, Jeff, how, how much honey do you typically pull off your bees? Is it you, do you have two brood boxes and you pull everything above it? Do you, do you leave them a box of honey? Do you take everything and feed? Uh, how, how well, I, I run, I run everything deep. So all my, all my yeah. supers are deeps and I have a double uh, deep brood box and then I'll put my honey super. I don't run excluders. Uh, I just throw the, the honey super on. And generally, you, I don't care if my queen gets up into the honey super and lays because what I do when I, when I check my supers is I, pull, I, I just pull the center frames. If I do have brood on them, I go into the second box, pull the outside frames of honey and just transfer the frames out at that point. And I only take um, honey from the third box. That's all I take. I, I never go into my second boxes. And that that was the, the good thing about this year. I was in in, um, a, in April and May, I was concerned that I'm gonna have to actually feed our bees this year to get them through winter. I was that that was my biggest dread. And so what happened when I was doing the harvest and when I'd pull off the, the honey super and I look in the second brood box and I see it's all white in the top. I said, man, oh, that's great. And then I then I do a, a weight check like you did. I just pick up the the back of it and they were they were all 45, 50 pounds. I mean, there's lots of stores in it. They they there was enough nectar for them to store nectar for their dearth. For the for the for the summer and fall until we get our, our fall flow and then um, I was still blessed to get eighty gallons of honey <laughs> off of them <laughs> so the I, at least I don't have to feed my bees now I'm still going to go back because um, I didn't check all of them the the one the weaker ones I've still got to go look and and I still may have to feed that because I don't I really don't want to dip below a hundred hives I don't if I hit a hundred coming out of the fall i'm i'm fine with that i i'm good with that i just don't want to go below 100 that, that's my goal uh, blake i want to ask you one of these questions that i <clears throat> sorry i need to eat my honey <laughs> about when about when would you remove a third box that you added for the additional room so like the airspace yeah. box when would you remove that <clears throat> yeah, usually, uh, you know, October time, late September, early October, you know, once daytime temperatures are not in the 90s anymore. So once it cools off a little bit, um, and again, I'm only adding that third box if, I mean, if you've got two deep boxes just completely packed with bees, then that third box can give them a little bit of breathing room. Uh, that's one of the many things that, again, it's not necessary. And and I love, you know, I Jeff, I love your approach um, because there is a lot of times at beekeeping where I think we can just relax a little bit. You know, we, there's a lot of things we don't have to do. And, uh, you know, I often talk about what is optimal. But again, you pay attention to queens, mites, and nutrition, and you're pretty good on everything else. And, uh, and you know, adding boxes or exactly how you feed supplements, et cetera, not always critical. Uh, 
but uh, but if you got a couple hives in your backyard and they're your babies, you know you can go to add an extra box and then take it away. I I, I agree, Blake. I, you know, it's it really it's it's the individuals perception of how they should keep bees that they should follow they they shouldn't be regulated by business or they they should do it by what what they how they want to do it now of course you, you do have to have a sense of knowledge um, of what you're trying to achieve how you want to achieve that um, and then go about doing it but how you keep your bees that's your right you you have the right to do that but uh, there's always, you have to know something, uh, some things about it. And I, I always, my, my theory is that if, if I have a failing co colony, I'm going to blame the queen 90% of the time. It's something on the queen, uh, mm -hmm. you know, something. And, and, uh, and, and as, as, as bad as it is to lose a hive, if I lose a hive, I'll move on because there's, there's always going to be another one. You know, splits always make up. For losses so, and, and that's that, that's one of the hardest lessons new beekeepers have to overcome is that sense of loss of losing highs like oh i'm a terrible beekeeper bees die all the time that that's all there is to it and 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 i understand like you said like oh they're my pets they're my babies well i understand that but <laughs> you know they're they're they really aren't your babies they're really not your pets they're insects and and but we want to do the best for them. I mean, we're stewards. That's it. And we, sh we, we should do the best job that we are capable of doing to, to, to help, help the bees to be a bee. And, and if I can do that, I think, well, I, I, that's the best beekeeper I want to be. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I, somebody asked a question that is one I wanted to ask you too. So you can talk about, and I totally agree with you, you know, hive losses are a part of every successful beekeeper's journey. I mean, you, you, there's a, certainly a limit to not babying a hive too much. You know, I mean, you don't want to string along a weak hive with a bad queen for three months, you know, I mean, it's better just to take your losses and move on. Um, so somebody asked, and I think it's good, do you, do you buy queens or do you let your bees raise their own queens? How do you, how do you handle uh, genetics? Uh, I have never bought a queen, never. Wow, um, really? That's amazing. Uh, I, I, I love, I love letting my bees make their own queens. So we, we have, we have 10 different yards and, and they're, they're almost at the point where there's like, um, they're mostly at seven years, most of these yards at seven, seven years, and they're all spread out miles apart from each other. Um, and I, like I said, I either do splits using swarm cells from my, from my queens, or I let them draw emergency cells. And it's, it's always their own queens. And so they're, they've got their own drones. I mean, there's always, they're always in wooded areas. So there's feral bees all around us. So I, there's no controlled yard, um, but in a sense, control that um, our yards are isolated and, you know, the idea that, you know, our drones are, are mating with our queen. So you're kind of getting a, a single genetic line in that. But I always like to throw in the curveball by bringing in new genetics from cutouts because I love, I love bring, bringing in um, new genetics. I, it's, I, it's yet to hurt me um, to, to bring in swarms. And now swarms or cutouts. Uh, that that I do, um, generally the swarms that I, I I catch I'll keep at my yard at the abbey because those I sometimes I like to feed them. Uh, those those are really the only ones that I feed or, or ones that need attention. I put them on my back porch of my honey house and I, I care for them right there. Um, once they go in the yard, like I don't I don't open up a hive unless I'm going to collect my rent or do a split. That's about that's about my maintenance of bees. That <laughs> it don't get much easier, but <laughs> I love uh, that he collects rent. <laughs> I love that too. That is so awesome. <laughs> well, what so what are the temperament of your bees then? Oh, you yeah. better wear a suit. <laughs> yeah, better wear a suit. suit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Well, they, don't, they don't get a lot of human contact. Well, and that's, and that's the trade-off, right? That, that is the trade-off. But if you ever look at the videos, when I'm working the bees, they're not aggressive. They're, I don't smoke my bees. I, I put a couple little bit of smoke in it. I don't worry about it. I don't like using smoke. I've, I get away from using smoke as much as I can. Uh, anytime I open up a box, I put something in. But once once I'm in a box, uh, uh, they, and, and I'm not doing inspections like you do, Blake. I, I always fear inspections because I'm always worried about hurting bees, killing bees, killing my queen. And, and uh, so it's, it, I'm telling you, I do not go into my bottom box hardly like zero times. I'll, I'll, so You're I'll a bad influence, on. Jeff. You are a bad influence. I know. I'm not a good beekeeper, I'm telling you. That's why I can't why people tell me, oh, I've learned so much from you. He said, I, I don't teach anything. <laughs> But, but I love it because I, I think you talked about this earlier, Jeff, and I love it is you get to pick what kind of beekeeper you want to be and you get to pick how you want to keep bees. And that's what's part of the fun of it in my mind is you can do that. You know, there, there's, you know, there's almost no wrong way to do it. And so I'm, I'm fascinated by what you're, you're laying at here is it's, it's, it's just oh, a it, different I'm way of doing it's, it. it. It's, um, it is like fly by the seat of your pants operation. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. It really is. Now, good time, Charlie. He's with me almost on every everything. Charlie, Charlie was a, a he was a, a pilot, a commercial pilot, and he retired. And he came to one of our B meetings. He probably doesn't want me to tell this, but he he would fly the the mosquito plane um, for the parish, and that's why he, Charlie got into bees was because they were saying they were killing his bees. So Charlie lived right by the airport. He, he set up beehives in his own yard and he'd spray his own yard to, to see if there is an effect. And, you know, by the time those planes are flying, the bees are in the box. It, there's, there's, there's always going to be people saying they, they kill my bees and, pe and people say they don't. Well, Charlie, to me, has proved it. they don't really kill the bees. And so that's how Charlie got into it. When he retired from that, he didn't ever any anything to do so he started coming helping me and now charlie's shooting video with he charlie shoots all of my video just wow. like you got underneath the, the thing well charlie does all that stuff charlie loves <laughs> shooting video and and he goes on all the all the um he helps me harvest honey and man he is like the biggest help there is I, i'm a blessed guy to have charlie as a friend <laughs> yes you are i need a charlie yes oh uh, yeah everybody did have a charlie yes. and all the yes. youtube yes. guys they all say Man, we, we wish we could have a camera, man. <laughs> um, a guy, uh, Kenny is asking how many cutouts you average per year, Mr. Ed. I, I, don't, I don't do a lot. I, I probably do 50, 60. I don't, I don't do a lot of cutouts. Again, the, re the reason I don't do a lot of cutouts is because they don't pay me to do them. <laughs> I do them pretty much for free. And yeah. that I would definitely say if you're going to do a cutout, Based, you should you should charge and you should charge them based on what you know. Uh, I've learned a lot about bees. That's in fact probably what I've learned most about bees is from doing cutouts. I, I, I've learned bee behavior from from observing bees, and I would recommend that to everybody. That when you when you inspect your your bees, don't just go in there with a, a set frame of mind of questions. What are you going to look at? What are you looking for? observe everything, observe, watch everything, watch what the bees are doing, look how they're doing, look how they're working, look at their duties. There's, there is a wealth of information if we just observe it. We just have to um, take that, that pause to, 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 I always say for myself that I lose myself when I work bees, mm -hmm. that, that it's not me. I'm not, I'm not trying to get anything. I just want to observe and, and learn from what I see. I don't want to make uh, um, ideas or, or, or get ideas on, on what I see. I just want to look at it. And then when you go to bed at night, then you can think about it. You know? So that, that break time, it's really, for me, it was really, really important. And, and so I, I've got a luxury that most beekeepers don't I have a little bit of knowledge which is dangerous and and then I have a lot of free time on my hand so 
with, you know, coupled with those things, you know, it, that's a that's that's a perfect uh, example of renegade beekeeper, and and that's really what I am. I'm not a beekeeper. I'm just a bee wrangler. That's it. <laughs> but I love bees. I'm just feeling relaxed listening to how you describe um, how you all of it. I, yeah, it's just it sounds wonderful. <laughs> yes. Um, well, part of it, part of it has got to do. Well, it's all got to do with my 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 belief, my, my religious belief, and. It, it, amazingly is, and this is all part of my story that I talk about when I talk at, at conferences, is, is that my time with the Benedictine monks, um, I, it, it's, it's a spiritual experience for me with bees. And so it, for me, working bees is just another form of prayer for me. And so very often when I am working bees, particularly cutouts, um, removals, it's it's like uh, I'm I'm working the bees, but at the same time I'm I'm doing prayer. I'm 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 asking for guidance. I'm you know that what I'm doing here, you know, I want to do for good for the bees. I'd like to get something from it, but man, you know, I, I want to experience what's in front of me. To live in that moment of where you are, that is the most rewarding thing. And that that living in that moment. That is what's going to sustain a person in their journey that on that on, on their beekeeping journey. Because when we're faced with all the difficulties, the work of beekeeping, you become disappointed, disillusioned, and then you lose interest. But if we if we can always see a newness about it, it's always going to be new and, and you'll keep on coming back year after year. I've been doing it since 1978. <laughs> and, wow. and I don't, I mean, I plan on doing it till I can't do it. It's a great life. That is awesome. Isn't that awesome, Blake? Yeah, I think you beautifully summarized why so many people keep bees, you know, and and yeah, I mean, it, it's, I, I think of hives for heroes, right? You know, all the, right. uh, and, and the, 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 how relaxing beekeeping can be. I, I have so many people that tell me, oh, I just get home from work and I go, I just want to watch my bees. I just want to watch the entrance of the hive. It's just, it's relaxing. It's de-stressing. And that's, that's amazing. Um, somebody in the chat. Wait, what Bob, is, Bob, Bob Ross beekeeping. You, Bob Ross <laughs> beekeeping. <laughs> what about when, you, when, uh, when, when like after the honey harvest and you put all your supers out there um, uh, and the bees are cleaning up, and you just get to stand there with yeah. thousands of bees. That to me, man, that is the moment right there. So when we, when we, uh, in fact, um, uh, not not tomorrow's post, but next Friday's post, I'll, I'll do the honey harvest, and and I start the video with that that shot of just the bees on the cleaning the supers, and to hear the sound of those bees. Man, it's just like, it's not that high pitched sound of a swarm, but it's this, this feeding of bees that all they're interested in is getting this honey that's available to them. There's no, there's no sense of, that you feel that urgency from the bees, but at the same time, there's, there is this calmness in this chaotic situation. I mean, you look at it and say, you'd be crazy to go in there. And it's, if that's not the case at all, it's like, man, I want to stand right there and I just want to be in it because that, mm -hmm. that's it. That's the, like the epitome of what you can experience as a beekeeper. It really is. And I know you know it, Blake. <laughs> oh, I've done it many times. Yes. Yeah. And it, it, it's, yeah, you, you, I'm not going to try to explain it. You explained it beautifully. It's, it's one of the most unique experiences you could ever have in beekeeping. It's, it's stunning. And so now tell us, so we only have a couple minutes left. Tell us how to find your YouTube channel. Because uh, I, I, everybody needs to see that video that, that you're publishing. The, the easiest way to find me um, is, is if you look for Mr. Red, because that's the, Mr. Red and Bees. That's the easiest way. You'll find me that way. Or you go look up my name, which is kind of hard, is Jeff Horchoff, H-O-R-C-H-O-F-F, -F, Bees. But it's a lot easier if you just have Mr. Ed and Bees and you'll find me. And we'll, we'll link to your this, YouTube. What's that? Oh, we'll, we'll link to your YouTube channel too. Oh, we'll we'll thanks, send it out to, to everybody in our, in our follow-up. I do want to ask two just lightning round questions because two people okay. put it in. Do you treat peripheral mites? I'm betting no. 
No. no. Yes. Okay. And then uh, do you use screen bottom boards or solid bottom boards? I'm betting solid. Well, I, I have all screen bottoms, but if oh, I was screen, to, okay. if I if I were to do it all over again, I'd use solid bottoms. Interesting. Can you give us a 30 seconds on why? The reason why is because from cutouts. I, I've learned so much uh, from cutouts that these really, really, really do better in a closed system because they can manipulate the airflow better. I, I'm not saying <clears throat> that screen bottoms are bad. I'm not going to replace mine. I'm going to keep them. But if I were to do it all over again, I would use solid bottom boards. I would. Got it. And then what kind of feeder do you like to use when you feed your feeders? I don't feed my bees. <laughs> but so when I, when I do feed bees, the ones on the back porch, I feed them honey and I just put them in bottles and I and just invert them over the inner Got cover. It. That's all. Jar, mice and jar. Mice right. and jar. I, I don't feed sugar water. I, I feed them honey. I've always got honey, except for this year. But with yeah. cutouts, I've always got honey in there. So I try to feed them honey. I I, I believe in giving them the best. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, that is that is so amazing. I uh, the Bob Roth of beekeeping. I, I think that, no. that that might be your next YouTube channel title. Uh, I think that would be amazing. It'd be so perfect. <laughs> well, uh, it, it it's a wonderful life. And, and and I I hate to say it, I owe it all to the post office because I got to retire when I was 52 years old, and and I haven't looked back since. <laughs> that's amazing. That is so fantastic. Well, I mean, thank you so much for, oh, for thanks for jumping on here with us. I mean, it it's I I think I just the next time I have a stressful day of beekeeping, I think I'm going to come back and just watch this 30 minute segment, <laughs> and I think it's just it's just going to take my heart rate right down. So that's it's, it's but like so one day cool. I, I really would love to come up. I, I'd love to come tour your, your facilities and anytime make, that would be awesome. I, I've got a, a, a great love for machinery. It's part of my, my background, which is one of the reasons why when I did our honey house, I, I, I use that the machines that I use. Uh, I'm, I'm big into that kind of stuff. It's just something that's always fascinated me. And, and uh, the, the hobbyist stuff, it just, I can't, I can't hang with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, any, any, any time. Yeah. You, you name the day and the time. We'll be happy to show you around. Thank and you. Next time in Louisiana, you. I'll, I'll be looking you up. So, oh, please do. Please do. I'm well. easy to find at the Abbey. Very easy. Wonderful. Wonderful. Fantastic. Jeff, thanks so thank much. You. Oh, y'all. Yes. Thank y'all very much for asking me on this evening. I, I really enjoyed being here. And Blake, great meeting you. And Sherry, it was a pleasure meeting you uh, yeah. it, when I was at, in Conroe and, and Looking forward to seeing you again soon. Blake, and I hope to see you real soon, too. I'm sure I will. Yes. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you. all Thanks, Jeff. God bless. All right. Thank you. Well, folks, that is about it. Uh, we like, a, a, as we always remind you, we'll be sending a follow-up email out to uh, everybody that signed up for this webinar that'll have the recording to this webinar. It'll have links to the products and videos we talked about. We'll be linking to Mr. Ed's YouTube channel. Um, and of course, the Bee Supply Monthly Magazine uh, that Sherry edits. Um, and uh, with that, uh, we will see you guys in August. So stay cool out there and we'll see you soon. Good night.